welcome everyone to another episode of Night Callers Bigfoot Radio. It is March 27, 2017, and we're here with the entire crew. So I uh, just want to say howdy, howdy, everyone. How are y'all doing tonight? Lost my mic there. I'm doing well. How are y'all? Doing good. I'm doing good. Yeah, How about I'm you? here. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all didn't get blown away by the storms, I guess. No, it was that amazing. That blew real me. hard, but that's about all I got. Yeah. yeah. Well, we weren't home, and then we came home. It had rained a lot, but on the way we were passing fallen trees and stuff like that. But I thought, my gosh, I hate to see what our place looks like. We just got rain. It's oh, like we wow. didn't even get any wind. There was not an air a pine cone on the ground. It was crazy. But um, down there on the lake, they did have what they think may have been tornadic activity. So some houses damaged and things like that. So I don't know. Supposed to have more of the same this Wednesday. So I guess that's what we're got to look forward to. Yeah. Ah. Same here. We got our little tornado bags already and you know, and uh we're we're prepared, so if that means probably nothing'll happen because that's how that works. <laughs> that's good though. That's good yeah. though. Yeah, I'm okay with it. Um but yeah, we it's that season in Oklahoma and Texas, you know, it's uh, mm-hmm. snowing one minute in March and the next you got tornadoes and that's all in the same day. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> there was this one lady on the news, she she was showing her little tornado shelter and she had like an interior closet and she got in there under an exercise mat and she had on a helmet. Uh-huh. And she also had her little bag of three days worth of clothes and water and canned food and she had her dog in there with her and she says I'm all ready then I'm like yeah okay (laughs) we have a Um, I have a Adam's little bike helmet for him and when Xander gets big enough he'll have a helmet as well but hail and debris is no joke I'm not trying to survive the tornado to you know get knocked out by hail um mm -hmm. and then I actually have a friend that has a tornado box, and it has helmets, food, water, clothes, all that, but it's also got hard copies of all her pictures. She's more oh. organized than I I ain't got time for all that, but I do have... Yeah, that would be a bad thing to lose, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh, wow. Huh? Huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, so I... Yeah, nothing big here. No big news. Definitely no big bugfoot. Oh Lord, that's that's <laughs> my vocabulary tonight. I've got nothing left. So anyway, <laughs> I'm ready for the for the show to start when y'all are. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I just want to announce to everyone out there, I got a ZTR mower this weekend, zero turn radius mower. And I am most I'm breakers. jealous now. I couldn't get I could not get off of it. I am not lying. I had so much fun. I was mowing everything. I even went in and mowed the garden. I mowed everything. <laughs> I I just loved it. I just loved it. And now I'm just waiting for the grass to grow. I never thought I'd be there. But I love that thing. It sure do. <sighs> Well, that's my excitement. <laughs> <I'm a lawnmower. laughs> Our whole house got the flu and she got a lawnmower. You win. <laughs> I win. <laughs> you win. Oh. Well, okay. If we don't have any new news, I know I had something to share, but I, I don't know what it was, so I'll... It's still important next week. We'll share it then. So uh, let's go ahead and bring on our guest. Oh, okay. You're going uh, to read okay. the... Sister? I was going yeah. to, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Nightcaller's Bigfoot Radio presents... 
Scott Carpenter from Tennessee. Scott Carpenter has been researching the Bigfoot phenomenon and other cryptids since 2009. Scott is the author of four books and three active blogs on the subject to include the Bigfoot Field Journal, Volumes 1 and 2, The Dogman, Man, Monsters Are Real, and his latest release, The Nephilim Among Us. A member of... No- <laughs> you have to throw these words in here. <laughs> a member of the North America Bigfoot Search, Scott participated in the groundbreaking Sasquatch genome study, contributing multiple hair and saliva samples, 11 of which were used in the study. Scott's research has been featured on the TV show Finding Bigfoot, and more recently, Scott's work was featured on award winning series by Les Stroud, Survivor Man Bigfoot. Scott holds a bachelor's in computer science and is the operations manager for a software development firm. He currently resides in East Tennessee, is married, has six children, and two great-grand... I'm sorry, two grandchildren. I'm trying to make you older than you are. I apologize for that. (laughs) Okay. I'm still old. No. Well, you've accomplished quite a bit in your young little life, sir. Thank you. (laughs) Six children. Wow, when do you have time to do anything else? Well, some of those, some of those, uh, two of those are stepchildren, so how's that? Uh, oh, okay, no, well, that's still, still pretty busy. Yeah, yeah. Must have hid away in your man cave and did all of this stuff. I, yeah. I don't know. I, that's quite a little uh you know we've had you on before i just want to let everyone know that if they want to see hear a previous episode with scott it's back in i think about 2009 2010 2010 okay well um scott it's been a long time and we have interviewed a hundred people at least since we talked to you last um you think you can kind of um kind of refresh our memories on how you got involved with Bigfoot in the first place? Sure. Uh, I had a, my first experience was a childhood experience uh, when I uh, was about nine or ten years old. And uh, my it was uh, late, late in the evening and my, we had, I live, I live in rural East Tennessee and uh, on Dead End Street, little farms all around us, and uh, it was during the summertime. Johnny Carson was coming on. I'd stayed up with Mom, and we had a long rectangular den. At the end of the den was a uh, was the screen door, uh, glass door. And Mom said, got up that you know I wanna I sit there on a couch with her watching watching TV, and uh, she said, I'm going to take the garbage out, and then we'll go to bed. And uh, so Mom got up, went out the back door. Of course, I'm sitting there on the couch. I can see. She left the door open with the glass, and I could see on the back porch the light was on. And right after she walked off the back porch, these two little monkey-like things ran up on the back porch and uh, pressed their little faces against the glass and looked in at me. Of course, that scared the living daylight out of me. And yeah. uh, they were, uh, one was probably about four or four and a half foot tall. The other was about a head smaller. They looked like, the uh, best way I could describe them, is they looked like orangutans, but they had, but their facial features were human. They had, you know, they had, uh, they had a, they had a human-like nose, kind of, like, of course, they could have, they could have stuck out from their face, but. And mashed their faces up against the glass, so you know their noses were wide and flat, and they had wide mouths. And uh, of course, they scared, scared. I, I just, I couldn't even move. I was just scared. And then they looked at each other, and then looked back at me and smiled at me. And that kind of made me feel a little bit better. And about that time, uh, back in those days, we we used 50-gallon drums for our trash cans. Mom shut the lid. The drum made a loud noise, and they jerked their heads around and took off. You know, they just took off running. Mom, but mom didn't see him come in. I, I asked her, did you see those monkeys on the back porch? Because I, I had no clue what they were. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, the monkeys. 
his monkeys on the back porch. And she just gave me an odd look for a minute. She said, oh, that was our neighbor's children playing, you know, playing a joke on me. Of course, my neighbors uh, were, were both blonde-headed. So uh, uh-huh. I, I, know, I think I know the difference between my neighbor's two monkeys. And I didn't push it any. Mama said, well, I, you know, my, she just kind of blew it off. But she did complain about the skunk smell, which I later was a clue. But uh, that was my first encounter. And that, that gave me nightmares for a long time. Uh, I Probably up into my early uh, to mid-20s. And then I finally saw a, an episode. I can't, rem- I can't remember. I'm trying to think it was in search of. For one of those type of you know shows that had a thing about Bigfoot on, and okay. I just in passing was watching it because at the time I had no interest in it, but I, I was, I was you know I was a little bit of a sci-fi buff and 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 UFO stuff, and so I, I watched it and they showed a, a you know they had a sketch on there, someone made a sketch of a mother and an infant, and when I saw that it just clicked in my head, oh my goodness, that's what I saw. So uh, that was that my first quote encounter, and then to get into it, you know, as an adult, back in 2009 when all this madness started, is a uh, uh, where a play I, the job I had uh, is a good job, but unfortunately I worked by myself in a in an office and uh, kind of isolated. And at lunchtime there just wasn't anything to do but sit there. And nowhere to go, so I, I started watching YouTube videos, and I started pulling up some of these Bigfoot research videos these people were doing. And uh, one of them, the people were making whoop calls and stuff like that. And I thought that's kind of funny, but I thought, eh, no. so I got on fishing in, in the early summer, and I was doing my thing. I was fishing off a, off a point and uh, the area that of the lake, there was about a 1,500-acre recreation area, uh, hike and horse ride, that sort of thing on it. And I was sitting there, and I thought, hey, you know, I don't know. You know, sometimes you just do silly things, and I just thought I'd make a few whoops. So I, I whooped four or five times, and, and of course, <laughs> felt kind of stupid. I felt kind of stupid about it. You know, I'm looking around. I hope no one else heard me. Of course, you know how it is on the lake. You you know, make any noise it carries, you know. I looked around, thank goodness there wasn't anybody close. I probably made one or two more casts toward the uh, toward the point when something came down, something started coming towards me. And I could hear it coming, you know, and it, it was, you know, it, it was bipedal and it was it was not walking, it was the best way to describe it. It was crashing through the underbrush. And I mean, as closer it got, the louder, more commotion. You know, and, and, and of course, it's got, by the time it gets close to the, to the bank down at the, uh, the water's edge, it's got my attention pretty good. And I'm, you know, and I'm just pretty much shocked at disbelief. I'm trying to have what in the world, you know? Uh-huh. I mean, this, this point, this, this place, I got pictures of it in my book. This point is growed up. I mean, it's, you know, you can't even walk. On the end of it, you know, it's waist high, you know, briars and honeysuckle. You know, you can't walk through that stuff. And whatever this thing is, just came crashing right on down the water's edge. And and I'm just sitting there with my mouth open, just looking. I, you know, and I, he never, whatever it is, never stays back into the shadows. The sun was coming up, and the way the sun was shining, the sun was in my eyes. And 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 on, on me and and so you know it was throwing some pretty deep shadows on the on, back up in the woods, and so but I could hear it and it was it was moving up and down the bank, and it would take four or five steps one way and makes it would break snap some limbs and, and turn around and go four or five back the other way. But this time, I, well, I'm I'm stepping on that trolling motor trying to find it, trying to get myself far off that shoreline as right. I can. And I, I think he must have heard the trolling motor because, you know, the trolling motor kicked off and it stopped for a second and then I heard what I can describe as like a hoop noise. You just, I heard a huh. Uh-huh. And I heard uh-huh. maybe two or three of those and then 
uh, whatever it was, started walking back up into the woods. But it wasn't this time, instead of making all the crashing, it was just, you know, bipedal, slow, deliberate walking, just walking away, just crunch, 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 until it finally disappeared. And so I'm sitting there just dumbfounded, not knowing what to think, you know. I couldn't believe it. I, you know, this had happened, especially to a whoop call, which was, you know, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Even call it a whoop call, you know, because I, but anyway, <laughs> so that, that, you know, of course, I just, that got me very curious. So the next weekend, I grab a, uh, grab a video camera that we had, threw on a backpack and into the woods I went. The rest is history, so to speak. So that's how I got started. It. Wow. Well, um, did you ever have a sighting once you were born? Oh, I've had. Oh yeah, I've had several sightings now. But uh-huh. uh, basically, to kind of speed it along, I started. I guess you could call it researching, researching that going in the woods with a video camera, knocking around, not knowing what in the world I was doing. Uh, I just wanted to try to figure out what had made that noise because I just couldn't believe, you know. I, I, it's not that I didn't believe in Bigfoot. Of course, I'd already seen them. But, I, I it, you know, it, it, it's just one of those things where you just, the curiosity, you got to, you got to kind of nail this thing down. Do I really hear that? Is this really going on? You know, I know as a boy, I saw those things, but, you know, you could, you know, that was a long time ago, you know, and and it just never dawned on me. And uh, so I started doing some, I just started researching, and it didn't take very long, and I started having things happen. I, you know, I found some Sign of them. Uh, I established a feeding station. Uh, started uh, things started happening. Started leaving the uh, Started finding footprints. Uh, had some imp, what I call what I think was infrasound experiences. Uh, that sort of thing. And one thing led to another, uh, and I started reaching the point in my research where I'm like, all right, you know, this thing is getting is way out of hand and I need some help here. So I, I started getting some video. I accidentally got, I literally accidentally got some video footage of one and uh, kind of fell on the idea. I noticed uh, actually what happened, I was messing around. I didn't even have a mono plot or anything. I was holding the camera in my hand and I was had been over and I was doing some stuff in the feeding station area. And I happened to hold it had my camera up against my chest as I'd been over and I feel as I'm doing that one one of them pushed its head through the brush and kind of took a peek at me and then and then went back in and uh and when I went home and reviewed the footage and saw that which freaked me out number one but made me uh-huh. realize made me realize that hey you know this thing only stuck its head out when my when my you know when I my back was turned to it basically, and so that's I got the idea from there. You know, hang on a minute. If they're you know because at this point they're just smart apes or some sort of you know I'm thinking they're just some sort of bipedal apes and putting their intelligence you know at a lower level. And I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute. So these guys are you know recognizing where I'm looking, so let's, you know, so I kind of came up with the idea, let's film behind me, and let's put a camera on, so I got, got a rig going on where I put a camera on my shoulder and film behind me all the time. So I started wow. doing that. Uh, I started getting gifts. I started getting some weird videos. At the what kind of gifts did you get, if you don't mind me asking? I'm oh, curious because uh, I've been gifted before. Yeah, well, I started. I started. I got blue jay feathers. Uh, I got uh, a weird thing. That, the first thing that uh, was interesting was I started. We started doing this thing with rocks. There was a I, there was a little piece of uh, it was like a this place at one time 
on the lake that had houses and those sort of things. There was a ferry station near where the painting station was. Of course, they moved everybody off the lake, and the place had grown back up into a wilderness area. But, you know, there were still remnants. And so there was a piece of, uh, of countertop, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, oh, for mica or granite? Yeah, or? no, it's, it's rock. It's, uh, it's marble, marble. And so marble. it was about yeah. a little piece of flat marble about six inches long. So I laid that out, and I put four rocks on it, and, uh, from largest to smallest, going from about the I don't know about the size of a wall, and then all the way down to the size of a marble. And okay. I left I left that and some food. Well, the very first, so I leave all that, and I'll come back the next week, and all four of the rocks are gone and replaced by four other rocks, different. And... But they're the same size, but they're uh, they're obviously, or I'm sorry, not all four, but two of them, and they're obviously different rocks. You know, I looked at the, you know, I, I looked at the video, you know, I let the, the week before and the, what I had and did the comparison. There was, you know, there was no doubt. And so, and then for two or three weeks, uh, they would shuffle the rocks around, and then they switched them back. I got the original rocks back. So that was one That had to be thing. very exciting. Yeah, it was Something like weird. That because it, <laughs> well, I mean, you can't you can't say a squirrel or a raccoon did that. I mean, yeah, they no, would either be gone or or they'd be scattered about or. Yeah, and another thing I also noticed is lots of times they wouldn't move the rocks from their position, but they twist them one eighty. They twist every oh. rock one hundred eighty. Every one of them exactly 180 degrees. So if you weren't paying, if you weren't documenting and paying attention, you'd miss it. Right. And and then they started doing this three and one pattern. Uh, I started putting like five or six or seven or eight rocks, and they'd always knock they'd always knock the extra rocks off, and they'd put three in a group together and leave one by itself. And that pattern has that. And that's, that's, for me, that's their signature. That's how they let me know they're, who they are. I mean, I, I mm-hmm. been, up to about two months ago, that pattern showed up in my backyard. And see, I'm the only one that knows about it. So when, when I go out in my backyard and there's, there's uh, four sticks and three of them are closely and they're exactly aligned together, and there's a four stick about six inches away and everything's in a, perfect line, I kind of understand what's going on. Uh, so are you talking with, about syllabic? Uh, yeah. Well, what they I don't call think it? That, yeah. Well, the lining up the rocks, the rocks, I don't think was syllabic. I think that's the signature, but they did do some syllabics later, yes. Mm-hmm. They did okay. make some symbols, syllabic symbols, which I documented in my first book. But, uh, Gift-wise, uh, one they, I did get left uh, it was some. It was a it was a. I don't own. Call it. A, I think it was a hawk. Uh, I got a. People have argued with me about whether it was a hawk or a, what kind of game bird it was, but it had a da- downturned bill. But it was the skull of a, of a bird of a like a hawk, and it was in perfect condition, not crushed. Uh, all flesh completely removed, and it was laying. It was laying on a, a pad. It was laying on some moss. Uh, of course, I got the feathers. Uh, I, I got the, through the time. I got various uh, rocks and sort of those sort of things. Sometimes some bones. Different times, of little bones would be left. That sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But that uh, sounds very similar to the things that I was being gifted. It started out I was getting animal skulls that I thought, I don't know, I pick them up and then I put them back down and I, because I didn't take them. But then they started gifting me feathers mm-hmm. after that. And the feathers I would take. But, yeah, um, yeah well, go, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just oh, no. To... But, yeah, there's a, but long story short, 
all this started happening, and I, I started. I, I realized I needed to get get some help here, get some more information. So I started. You know, I, I you know I needed some support, so to speak, from some you know a group with a little bit more you know a little bit more experience than me. So I started kind of looking around. I looked at the BFRO, and then I stumbled upon uh, North American Bigfoot Search and David Plides, and he had just come out with his, that, his book, uh, uh, The Hoopa Project. So I ordered that book, read that book, looked at the you know the pictures in that book, and and, uh, and then so uh, I started emailing him and saying, Hey, you know. Yeah, you know, I'm starting to have some stuff happen here. And so we did this little thing for several months where I'd email him things and uh and I'd email him photographs or videos. Of course I think at first he thought uh, you know, who is this clown? You know <laughs> he wouldn't admit that, but you know, I, I you know, he used to get all kinds of you know, still does, but you know, I yeah. just I didn't overwhelm him if I found something I'd just send it to him or I I had a uh, incident happen. I would describe this happened to me. Have you all ever had that happen? And I think as time went on, I started having, I started describing events, whether it be a bluff charge or, uh, uh, you know, some sort of vocalization or a picture or something. You know, started. You know, he's like, hey, this guy's not. He's not pulling my leg. He's, you know, something's really happening here. And one thing led to another, and uh, uh, I, you know, and he started. They started the Sawsbuck genome study started in infancy, and he started asking me if I, he, you know, asked me to do try to collect some hair samples. We started trying to figure out how to get hair and, and saliva samples, and then uh, he, uh, one thing led to another. He finally invited me to jo- join the group North American Bigfoot Search, which I did. And then and kind of got fully involved with the DNA study. And uh, we come up with some interesting ways. We tried to, uh, early on in the study, uh, Dr. Ketchum, and you know, there's so much to tell an hour and a half, it's not going to make it. So I'm going to kind of <laughs> try to blow, I'll try to blow through some of this. Uh, basically, with what how the DNA study got started, was you had Dr. Ketchum. And, you know, you all know who Josh Gates is. You remember he's he's got a show now on the Travel Channel. Yes, and, yes. All right. Well, back then he had a show called Destination Unknown, and they went and over into Europe. They went over into the Alps somewhere in Europe, and they actually he found a footprint, and he also found some hair, some Yeti hair, and he came. He brought it back, and they tried to find somebody to test it. The producers right. were looking, and Melba, at the time, was thought Bigfoot was a joke. But the producers offered her some good money, and she said, "Sure, I'll test your hair." And uh, she kind of screwed around and and messed up a bunch of it. But when she finally uh, got a good run out of it, the results shocked her because she's like, "Well, this is right. This hair." This hair is not human hair. I can tell that by looking at it, you know, from its morphology. But she said, I'm getting uh, human mitochondrial DNA. This ain't right. You know, something ain't right here. Uh-huh. And so that kind of, that didn't convince her, but that got her in the right frame of mind. That, hey, it's something going on. And so at that same time, you got David Flydes. He's getting hair, you know, he's starting to get hair samples. He's trying to get things tested. And he goes to lab after lab, and they, they won't talk to him. He'll say, you know, I, I want you to do some DNA testing for me, and we'll just we'll provide the samples and pay for them. And they say, well, what are we going to be testing? And if the minute he mentioned Bigfoot, they just said, nope, we don't want to do that. You know, leave us alone. I wonder why. I wonder well, why. I think it's it's more it's kind of complicated, but I, I think it's got a lot to do with you know the embarrassment of it. Number one, if you did test it, it was big, but and, you know at that time, especially mm-hmm. in 2010, and, and the implications you know are still pretty right because if you got 
if Bigfoot exists, it calls into question some scientific norms. A lot of these guys aren't willing to go, you know, aren't willing to go there. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of things I think, you know, come into play there. It's just not a com- it's not a simple answer. But so he's so here, you know, David's looking around. Uh, uh, you know, for someone to test it, and I don't know, you know, don't know exactly how or when, but someone said you ought to talk to Dr. Ketchum. You know, she did the jo- uh, Josh Cage show, and she got some Yeti hair. She got some weird results. At least she was willing to test it. And so David and her kind of met up, and he, you know, pretty much it kind of got started. You know, I've got some hair samples. If I send you some hair samples, et cetera, et cetera. Would you be willing to test them? She's like, sure. You know, if you're you got money, you're willing to pay for it. I, I'll I'll do I'll I'll do your test. Your testing, and that's kind of how it got started. Of course, as they got into the study and they started, you know, the results started coming back. You know, Melba kind of realized, ooh, you know, this thing, you know, this is, you know, I've got bigger than he thought on. it was going to be. Yeah. Well, she started. Uh, when she first started, you know, she they had they got a hair expert, and uh, and they would have him look at the hair under the microscope because you don't want to test if you know it's a bear hair, if you know it's donkey, if you know it's wolf, you, you don't want to test that. But back then, especially, it was expensive to do a run, very expensive. You know, two or three thousand dollars sometimes just to test you know a small sample. And so, so they had, they uh, they had the guy would go through, and he would screen the hairs, and he would only pull out the hair that he that he he knew didn't match anything else. And then, fortunately, uh, David was able to get a hold of uh, hair that they well they just knew it was big, but because of the situation, uh, they had a woman at, at a Hoopa project. Uh, she had. Uh, heard something rummaging around in her little metal building there on the reservation. And so she takes her phone and goes down the steps, goes around the corner, and voila, there's a, a 12-foot Bigfoot uh, rummaging through her garbage uh, in this little metal building. And she, as he's reaching in and grabbing the bags of garbage, he scratches himself and pulls out a big tuft of hair right on the corner of that, of that open metal door. And so she goes, voila, there it is. Uh, and she calls her brother, who's on the hoop of the police department. He rushes up there. The funny thing is, the Bigfoot looks at her and kind of just shows her off, and like, hmm, "What are you going to do about it?" And continues yeah. to go through the garbage. Continues to go wow. through the garbage. When her brother starts up the, dr- uh, the long driveway, he picks up the garbage bags that he wants to take with him, and then walks off into the woods. Of course, when the brother gets there, you know. There's the you know there's the blood and hair and so he basically forensically he you know takes out his little kit puts his gloves on and collects it and so boom we've got a sample that we're you know about 99.9 percent sure is Bigfoot so right. given that given that now we actually have Bigfoot hair so you know we actually had in, in the study they actually had a something to compare the hair to, you know, microscopically. So we go through and compare the hair microscopically, you know, and I had to only send off the hair that he knew was Bigfoot for testing. Uh, and then later, and then I actually found out that normal hair will yield mitochondrial DNA. Now you can, you can grind it up like human hair and other animal hair. Uh, it will... It, uh, it will, if you grind it up and go through the process, you can get mitochondrial DNA. Well, Bigfoot hair is different, and it would not yield any mitochondria or any DNA just by using the hair. None of the primers would bring would, would it wouldn't it, it would bring it out. So, you know, the only time that she would ever get any results from hair is if it had a skin tag. You know, with it had had the flesh, uh-huh. you know, with it. So, because she had wasted several thousand dollars, you know, trying to get it to, uh, uh, you know, try to get it to uh, uh, illuminate, 
and come up on the jail code. So, uh, so the word went out, you know, pretty much that hey, if uh, you know it doesn't have a skin tag, don't send it in. We can't use it. You know, it's just we just can't yield the uh, uh, big part of hair is not going to give us any DNA. And so we come up with a way. We had to figure out how to pull the hair out by the by the roots and. Working with David, we kind of came out with taking packing tape and uh, a heavy packing tape, clear packing tape, and, and wrapping it sticky side out around the tree. And then I would put, you know, apples or in the wintertime, I'd actually put bacon grease in the bark of the tree. And the Bigfoot would lean up against the tree, lick out the bacon grease from between the bark, and they would leave, and it would pull hair out by the roots. And so that's that's how wow. I got. That's how I got my sample, you know, pulled out by the roots, and it, it, it worked pretty effectively. You know, you always didn't get looked at hair. Sometimes a possum would climb the tree, and you know, it was pretty obvious. But you know, you know well, I am curious about how you got saliva samples. Well, I got those off of uh, uh, candy bars and granola bars. Uh, huh. The ones that, now I can only speak from my own experience, but they would take what they would do is like they would take the kid, they would take the granola bar, the candy bar, and I would leave them wrapped, and they'd put them in their mouths about halfway in, and they'd bite down and literally open the package that way. And then, you know, they'd bite the thing in half, and then they would apparently, it looked like to me that they would literally, you know, in their mouth, pull a candy bar out of the wrapper and then spit the wrapper on the ground, and then squeeze oh. the rest of the candy. And then squeeze the rest of the candy bar in their mouth. Uh, that's all, that's how I'm guessing they did it because one half of the wrapper wouldn't have anything on it, the other half of the wrapper would have saliva. On it. Okay. So I said, so you know, and as I and, and it didn't happen very often. I probably only had three or four of those and I sent you know of course I, I sent everything in you, you never know what you've got until they swab it and see what's on it so right uh, that's how they at least around here that's how they eat the candy bar okay but anyway so that's oh. how it all got started and uh, you can ask me any questions and yeah, I, 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 I'd like to know what happened. I mean, I've heard that uh, the that the scientific community would not accept the findings of the genome project. Is that That's basically correct. what happened? That's basically what happened. Basically, all right, to kind of keep going with it, as things started, uh, Melba, of course, got funding, uh, you know, got uh, from... Uh, Oh, what's his name? I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Uh, Wally. And Wally was help, was helped fund the project through David. And uh, I think ended up he uh, about three hundred thousand, maybe five, maybe a total of four hundred thousand dollars was what was all that was funded the study. If you know anything about any sort of scientific study, that that's pennies, you know. When a university does a study, it's millions of dollars. So they're on right. number one. They're, they're on a street. We're on a shoe street budget to begin with. But early on, after the first results, Melba kind of came to the realization that we've got something here, and I've got to put uh, protocols in place. So I'm going to be, you know, the, the scientific community is going to lose their mind. Uh, you know, in the past, when people had gotten uh, uh, you know, lots of times in the past, someone would come forward with a hair sample. They had it tested. It come back with human mitochondrial DNA, and they say, "Oh, you know, it's contaminated." Well, right. Uh, they, you know, David was scratching his head. Well, we got all this. You know, we got a bunch of labs that are incompetent, or something's going on here. So what Melba did is she started. Uh, she contact started contracting with labs. And she didn't even, you know, after the study got going, she didn't even do any of the testing herself. She basically, hmm. the, the, the sample would come in, they would screen it, screen it, and the guy would say, okay, these are Bigfoot's hair. And then she would, uh, she had uh, the labs, uh, 
I think there was 12 to 16 of them. I've got them listed. I don't know if I had to put them. There were 13 total laughs that she used for the blind testing of different different types of things. And so she would send those off, and in the, in the labs did not know what they were getting. She would say, okay. just, you know, run this and tell me, and please send me the results, and she'd pay them for it. And, I mean, and these are, some of these labs are some, uh, she used, and she used forensic. A lot of people, you know, wanted to scream, well, it's all contaminated. Well, she had, was a, as part of her work, she did uh, DNA. Uh, she, uh, what she did was her, her, before she lost her business, she used to do animal DNA uh, verification, like for horses, uh, you know, or uh-huh. bulls. Or dogs, like if, uh, you know, in Texas, you're in Oklahoma, you know, the selling of bull semen is a is a big business. And if someone says, you know, this is, you know, this, you know, this sample here is, you know, from this X prize bull, and, you know, I want X amount of dollars for it, you know, a lot of people would have that tested to make sure they were telling the truth. And so she did right. that sort of, she did that sort of testing. Same thing with, uh, with horses. And she was also... Uh, she did stuff, forensic stuff for uh, the courts. She would uh, 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 be a, fr- a forensic witness, uh, you know, on DNA uh, evidence for the court system. She actually, one of the court cases she helped solve was, to kind of tell you her credentials before she got into this, is there was a murder case where a college kid had lost his mind, had come back to the family home, killed everyone, including the dog, and then buried and then buried the dog and gone back to college. And his you know, his alibi was he never you know, he never came back home for that weekend. And mm-hmm. they knew that the do- they knew that the dog was a new family dog and the and the, the boy had never been around the dog. And so they actually they found they found where he had buried the dog, and when they found his vehicle, there were dog hairs in his vehicle. Oh, and man. so they sent the dog to Melba and said, can you extract the DNA from this dog hair and compare it to the DNA of the dog hair that was in his van, in his car, and they were a match. And they put his butt in jail and convicted him for it. So her, you know, So this was some of the work she was doing. You know, so anyway, so she knows how to forensically handle and wash the DNA samples, and that's exactly how they handled this the hair. They washed it, uh, they completely washed it. It was contaminated, and then sent it off to these labs to to be processed. So in some of the labs, you know, were, uh, some of the big labs were like uh, uh, North Louisiana uh, Criminal uh, Laboratory. Uh, Family Tree, Southwestern Institute for Infant Science, Seg Ride of Houston, Texas, uh, USC, Los Angeles, University of Texas at Arlington, uh, Texas A&M University, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So these are not uh, fly-by-night places. Uh, right. So, so she's and. So the samples started coming back, and what she started finding was she would send them off hair that was non-human hair, it was Bigfoot hair. So the morphology of the hair was not human. But the mitochondrial DNA, which comes from the mother, was human. And this, that she, so she started getting these results consistently through all her hair samples. And, uh, and and then she, you know, she wanted to do nuclear testing of the DNA, and that the nuclear side comes from the father. And and nuclear DNA is harder; is actually it's harder to actually extract. You've got to have a, a pretty good sample, blood, flesh. Usually, a hair sh- uh, a hair tag has just not got enough nuclear DNA in it to uh, show anything. And then right. uh, she. She got three samples that were, she got some hair that had enough, she got a little bit of nuclear DNA, but she just got small sequences. 
And all these sequences were kind of weird. They were not given results they should give. They wouldn't match anything in GenBank. One one lab even wrote or said, why didn't you send it to us? Because <laughs> this is weird stuff, you know. And, uh, of course, she tried. You know, she did her best. Actually, during the study, one lab found out that they were testing DNA uh, from Bigfoot, and they refused to send the samples back after she paid for them. And oh they gosh. had to go hire a lawyer to say, you will send the samples back. And they finally cut a deal with this lab. This lab was so adamant that they didn't want their name associated with these these test results that uh, the deal was she got the samples back, but she couldn't use them in the study. Oh. So so it totally freaked them out because they, they basically what happened was the lab ran the, ran the DNA, and they got curious, and they started running the DNA against GenBank, and it wasn't coming up. And they they basically called her on the phone and said, what have you seen us? This organism this hair came from does not exist. What kind of stuff are you pulling? And then she kind of, she said, we're, well, we're testing, you know, we're a, big, a Bigfoot DNA study. And when they did, they lost their minds. I know like, that. Well, we don't want to be involved in this, you know. So anyway, kind of show you the, you know, the issue she was running into even then. But at, she finally got three samples that were good enough to run nuclear DNA. When she did, the nuclear DNA came back unknown. It was very odd DNA. Uh, it was a long story. I've got a whole big, long chapter in my book that explains it. But basically, the, the layman's is the DNA was non contaminated, and she had three samples. That didn't match anything in GenBank. And for your listeners, GenBank is the database where all uh, organisms' DNA is is actually were stored these, in. It. Were these three samples from separate individuals? Yes, they were from separate individuals from separate locations throughout the country. Okay. One was from one was from California. One was from Oklahoma. And I'm trying to see, I'm trying to remember where the. I remember where the was from Oklahoma, California. The one there was one that that fit fit into a it was from a downspout, but I can't remember what state it was. From. I'll have to I'd have to look it up. But it, uh, they were from three different states, taken at different. Uh, with it, so most of the, most of these samples were collected a couple of years apart, so they weren't. Was Not it Arizona? Could have been Arizona. Is whether the downspout was chewed on? I have to look. The, I'd have to pull the sample stuff up and look at the locations. But uh, yeah, you know, so those samples, you know, didn't match anything uh, in Jim Bank. In Jim Bank is where you know there's where all every organism, you know, science that science community goes through and they. Discovered new organisms or even common organisms that upload the DNA sequences to the end of this uh, database. And then what you can do as a, as a, as a scientist, it's called a BLAST search. And the BLAST stands for the, long, the acronym, but basically you can take your sequence and compare it and see what if you have a match. Well, what she did, hers didn't match anything. And so, oh, wow. yeah, so she knew she had a, a new, you know, we, we kind of basically had a human eye. We had an organism that had a, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the mother was female because the mitochondrial, I mean, the mitochondrial was human, I'm sorry, female that was human, but the male side of the whatever Bigfoot was is unknown. And so, huh. so she got, she got her study together, uh, she try uh, they you know she started it it, kind of, it went it went a couple rounds it's this long long sorted story but basically she was very naive she thought that if the science was good that the scientific community would you know accept it and uh, and you know some people tried to tell her uh, uh, you know Melba 
<laughs> you don't understand. You're, you're messing with fire here. It doesn't matter how uh-huh. good how good the science is. There's no no reputable journal, no mainline journal is going to publish your paper. And she said, well, they have to. And he said, no, they don't have to do anything. And it doesn't matter what, what science you have. This, you know, the, the, the peer review process is not scientific. No matter what anybody tells you, it's a political gatekeeper type deal. And, you know, we learned, we got our eyes kind of opened when we started going through the peer review process because it's not got anything to do with science, trust me. And it's uh-huh. kind of how the, it's kind of how mainstream science, you know, filters what they want, you know, how they want things to go. And they, you know, they can poo poo stuff and, you know, it, it's a peer review. It's, you know, so, you know, it's their opinion about things. So basically, we went through the peer review process from the journal Nature. Uh, they jerked her around for about three years. Uh, she, uh, they would even most of the people wouldn't even read or review the study. Uh, and uh, uh, all the peer reviews and everything are, are out on the website. But long story short is after they jerked us around for two years, uh, they submitted the paper, they rejected the paper. Uh, they, and then, and then they invited uh, Melba to resubmit the paper with corrections. So Melba rewrote the paper. Colm Keller got involved from uh, helping her rewrite it. Uh, uh, they, she got uh, some assistance from some pretty high-powered uh, scientists that got in on the project. Helped. Uh, really, it wasn't the DNA that evidence she had. It was how the paper was put together and presented, et cetera. So they kind of rewrote uh-huh. the paper in a more, you know, uh, more like the journal Nature wanted to see it with, with uh, you know, in that, in their in their format, so to speak. And then, uh, they resubmitted it, and they kept jerking us around, and finally they pulled, they just told her, you know, no, we're not going to publish it. And they rejected the paper. So now, you know, three years have been wasted. So we're well, not wasted, but you know, dealing with uh, yeah, with You're journal nature. Bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at this point, uh, she uh, she started looking. You know, we, she wanted to get it published somehow. She wanted some sort of peer review. So she started looking around uh, for anything. And uh, you know. With, you know, whether it was going to be self-published or she would just actually just publish the paper publicly or what. Well, as she as she's uh, as she's trying to as she's asking people, you know, do we have any journals that would be willing to look at this? Some journals just laughed at her, wouldn't even look at the paper, et cetera. Uh, there was a there was a fella that was 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 starting his own journal, starting a new journal, and. Uh, he said, you know, he said, boy, if I could get your paper, this would be a big splash. You know, I, you know, I could make a lot of, a big entrance into the you know, journal publishing, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, he, uh, he, he got, uh, he got uh, three scientists, and uh, she submitted her paper, and they did the peer reviews, uh, they, uh, and they, went through the process and he said we're going to publish. He said he said the, the three guys that I got to look at this uh, have uh, you know all of their three that I they uh, you know this wants uh, publishing. Uh, they did their peer reviews and did through the process and he, he notified her uh, it'll be our first paper that we publish. And so uh, you know uh, the Basically, he uh, set everything up. We got the word, hey, we're going to get published, get everything ready. You may have to give an interview or two, blah, blah, blah. And then at the ninth hour, literally, I mean, we were, we got, uh, she had already paid the man the money, signed the contract. Uh, We were going to publish the very next day, and the the man who's going to do the uh, publish it calls her up and says, I can't publish. And she says, what do you mean you can't publish? We paid you money. 
you know, I signed the publishing contract. And uh, he said, well, my lawyer has has threatened to quit if I publish this paper. He said, I've been threatened by uh, some agencies if I publish this paper. And he said, I've got a family. I've got another, you know, my mainline business. This this journal was going to be a hobby of mine. And so he basically said, I'm sorry, but I can't publish. So at this point, you know, you know, it's pretty much all, you know, we don't, there's not a whole lot left, left you can do. And he said, and, and he basically said, listen, he said, tell you what, he said, getting into all this and seeing what a mess it is, I don't even think I'm going to have a journal. But if it's going to be like this, he said, I tell you what, I will sell you the journal uh, for a nominal fee. He said, that way you can, uh, those the peer reviews have already been independently done. That way you can preserve these peer reviews and you can publish your paper. So she bought the journal, uh, she renamed it, and then she published the paper. And then that pretty much, you know, from um, the minute it came out, of course, the scientific community ignored it. Uh, Todd Disatel did a hit piece on it. He he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, he does mitochondrial any. He admitted he didn't have the expertise. But, long, you know, long story short, you know, pretty much everybody ignored her. Uh, she was personally attacked. She lost her business. Uh, mm. Pretty much financially she was run. Uh, you know, you know, there's some, you know there's what, this, kinds this would make a great movie. Oh, yeah, it would. I, I think it would make a fantastic movie. Somebody out there listening, we need to make a movie on this. Yep. Oh my goodness. But, but anyway, they don't. They don't. They're not interested in making a movie uh, no, out of that no. because it hits too close to home and it tells too much truth. Um, I, I don't know if if you know that Melba and I are very very close friends, and I was a huge part of the project myself. Oh, okay. Well, did I, I, mean, did, I did I get anything wrong, or was I pretty much right on the money? <laughs> You know, there there were things there that, you know, you may have had, uh, may have been privy to that I wasn't, you know, different mm-hmm. conversations, different, uh, we represented uh, the, that to, the toenail that was in the Oh, yeah. Yeah. From, from Larry. Um, so uh, my, my partner, Alex Hearn, and I represented that, and uh, I was involved with Melba. She was a good, she still is a good friend. I, I, I love the woman dearly. Um, had lunch with her a while back, but uh, we met and had lunch there in, in Timpson. Uh, got town in between she and I. We only live about 30 minutes apart. Um, you know, it it was it was sad. You know, trying like you said, you know, trying to get people to review the yeah. the, the the study. You know, I mean, um, there were so many threats being thrown around and so much weight being tossed around by the powers that be and those that wouldn't even, wouldn't even look at it, wouldn't give it the time of day. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Oh, well, it's junk. You know, it's just, it's gotta be junk. And, and it, it it was infuriating. Yeah. 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 It was, it was, it was a, a bad time. I mean, I, I can remember, you know, uh, you know, with the uh, Smedges sample and all the crap that he tried to pull, and, and I pretty much think that was a that was a planned, uh, you know, way to uh, undercut the study and undercut her to and, sabotage uh, it. Yeah, it was a sabotage well, deal. You know, they got impatient; they didn't want to wait. You know, see the where they had us over a barrel was. When you've got a paper that's in peer reviewed, you're kind of under a gag order. You can't say anything. You're not supposed right. to talk about it. And so, right. you know, the journal Nature had this peer re- I had the paper, and you had people pounding on day after day. Where's the study? Where's the results? Uh, and then, you know, and then, you know, Smash a, uh you know, gets this bright idea that, you know, him with uh, Mark Patino and, and other fellow, 
bright idea that, you know, hey, we'll go test this stuff independently. And so, but see, the problem was that what Smadger gave them the test wasn't the same type of than what he gave Melba. And and it and it kind of blew up from there. And of course, now a lot of people, I hold to the theory that, you know, the rumors had already been leaking out that this was a human hybrid. Smancha had caught, shot and killed this thing in cold blood, okay? Hey, Jeff, and are I, you on speakerphone? I'm on my headset. Oh, okay. I'm getting, well, I am getting it, some, like, artifact noise there. It was probably, probably me because I've got my back scratcher in my hand and, of course, having a little bit of nervousness, you know, and difficulty ADD, you know, I'm, I'm hitting the hitting the wall with it and stuff. So I'm sure you were hearing me. Okay. okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, basically. Well, Justin, Justin's a total dipweed. Uh, I, I know Justin very well also. Uh, I knew him before all of this through uh, hunting forums and things like that. He was always around uh, yeah. the hunting forums, and then he showed up with this. And I actually, my first podcast I had, the Crypto Zoo, I had him on like just right after he admitted that he did this. And the story that he told on that show, Later on, whenever he told that story on national television, the story was different. The story changed. And then when I saw him on another show, the story changed again. Then whenever he got on $10 million Bigfoot Bounty, the story changed, and he sat there and said that he strangled the thing to death after he shot the mother and then shot the little one, and that he trailed it, and he actually choked it to death with his bare hand. And I'm sitting here going, dude, you are grubbing for your 15 minutes. Yeah, but what, how, however he got the sample, he sent Melba whatever he, he he gave Melba a good sample. I mean, she even went to the lengths of she did a core sample and she yeah. sent it to two different labs, and both labs came back with the same results that she did. And so you know, they were trying to say, oh, Melba faked all this. This is there. There's no way it could have been Bigfoot. But, you know, she had three different labs. You know, her, her she did it herself in two other labs. You know, and one of the labs actually uh, used uh, uh, mechanical means to actually extract the sample. And they all three matched. And the other, the interesting thing was the Happel group from her sample, you know, they kept saying, well, this is a bear, and here's our test, with, and then here's Justin's DNA, and it was a bear sample commingled with Justin's DNA. Well, the Happel top of Melba sample didn't match Justin or the bear. <laughs> so scientifically, it was proven that whatever, you know, the sample he gave her, you know, was not in any way, shape, or form contaminated or related to the bear or him. So, you know, and, you know, that's the problem with the whole deal is it, he, he got, it got so convoluted that, with, you know, that, you know, all we really know is we got a piece of flesh from a Bigfoot, and that's about all we know. Mm-hmm. You know, how, wow. you know, whether his original story is shooting the thing, it's true, you know, only God knows, I mean, and just it's magic. And the guy, and the guy he was with, who won't talk. But I, I, I think he was probably trying to protect himself from prosecution. Because if this thing came back human hybrid and he killed it cold blood, you know, especially in the state of California, you might have someone try to charge him with manslaughter. And I, I think. My personal opinion, that was probably the main motivation for muddying up the waters. Yes. Well, uh, um, and see, I also think that he was trying to keep from getting in trouble, too, because I, I, it's my personal opinion. I have no proof of this, so nobody get mad at me. But being a hunter and everything, I think he was poaching. For the simple fact, he was said he was hunting with a twenty five out six rifle. That's a varmint rifle. That's not a rifle you go hunt bear with. 
He was bear hunting in the mountains with a gun that shoots a bullet that weighs about a hundred grains. You will yeah. you would not go shoot a bear with a one hundred grain bullet. You shoot a bear with, with like a, a two hundred one hundred and eighty, two hundred even bigger bullets, a lot more powerful rifle. Uh, uh twenty five out six is a poacher's gun or a uh vomit rifle. And yeah. I always figured, you know, he was trying to keep from getting in trouble because he was doing some kind of hunting he wasn't supposed to be doing. Yeah, he was he was riding the roads is what he was doing. And they yeah, saw see, the and big and, and, Go ahead. No, I was saying he was probably, it sounded to me like he was riding the roads, and they saw those big foot. At first they thought they were bear, so he whooped out and just shot and probably shot from the road, which is illegal. Well, he even so stated he, in there that he, that he... If he dropped one, where, where's the body? Go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, okay. he, he, even, he even stated that he fired out of the cab of the truck. So, you know, I mean, that's where I'm going. I mean, he, he, was, he was poaching. I mean, he wasn't hunting. He was poaching. Yeah. And so, like you said, I mean, he, he was he was trying to lie his way out of getting in trouble with uh, the Parks and Wildlife Department. And like you said, when the DNA came back and it was a, a human hybrid, he was scared about prosecution there because yeah. California had some weird laws on that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Rick think, had yeah. a question. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rick. If he shot, if he shot and dropped one... Where's the body? What happened to any kind of carcass? Well, he he dropped two, a mother and a small one. Oh. Okay. Well, he couldn't find. He said he couldn't find an adult. He, he shot the baby, and he claims that out of fear, he buried it. <laughs> and when he finally came forward and told Eric Randalls what he'd done, they go back and. It had snowed, and in the area where he shot it, they found his pieces of flesh that had been supposedly blown off the body. I think it With was technically what they called uh, the Bigfoot steak. <laughs> yeah, they call it the Bigfoot steak now. Yeah. Do yeah, I, do I believe you would leave an empty Bigfoot body in the brush, hide it because of fear? I, I don't, I'm not believing it, but. I, I know that he had been author. Maybe I'd heard the rumor that someone had offered him a million dollars for the body if he had, if he had it, and he said he didn't have it. Well, see, so. that's the thing. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know, if you if you do, even, even though I am totally against, I am not pro kill. I'm totally against killing one. Um, but you know, you got to know that if you do bring in that that. Unicorn, you know that that gold, that goose that laid the golden egg. If you bring in the body, you're an instant millionaire. You're going to be on yep. everything from Nightline to Good Morning America. You're going to be paid just an un, unbelievable amount of money for everything. So you take somebody who's relatively, uh, you know, not well off, and you're telling me you're going to take a million dollars and stuff it under a rock and only after prompting by a friend you're going to go back and get it? I, the whole thing just stunk to me. I don't know what the real story is, but I, I do not believe that it's what he told. Uh, all, the, all the real thing we know is just the little piece of flesh he got Melba with big and that's all we know. Okay, I think we nailed down the the feedback is on our guest. Every time our guest talks, that we're getting a reverb. Is it me? Yeah, I think so. I, know, I think be, it, I, let yeah. me mess with. Let me re unplug and plug my headphone back in. Okay. Is that any better? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh great, great. Um, 
Okay, we only have like about 20 minutes left, and I really want to talk about your new book. Sure. And if you if you want to, I know there were a lot of other things we wanted to talk about, dog men, um, some of your experience um, with dog men and what you know about dog men. Um, could you share a little bit about the dog men, and then we're going to go into the uh, the Nephilim or Among Us. Is that, am I saying that right, Nephilim? Ne- yeah, the, yeah, it's pronounced Nephilim. Okay. All right. Um, uh, all right. The dog, well, the dog men, well, uh, if you've been Bigfoot researching for more than a few years, seriously, uh, unfortunately, other things show up. And you talk to any experienced Bigfoot researcher and, and buy him a beer and get him alone and he'll tell you some stories. Uh, I was one of the, you know, I was one of the fortunate ones that uh, I had a camera going when I got my story. So, uh, the first encounter actually happened. I had the back trail camera on like I told you and I was concentrating on a, on an island across, uh, I was standing on the shore and there's Little island, just uh, it just uh, there was a road bed that went between the mainland and this island. And while I was doing that, this tall man-like creature comes up from behind me, and uh, I've got the camera on my shoulder, of course, and I, and I kind of start to turn my shoulder. And as I do, he kind of levels his head off. And he's uh, probably about five, six feet behind me, in heavy vegetation. And uh, I get probably about seven or eight seconds of it. And uh, and then, of course, I continue to turn my shoulders, and he, uh, he slowly ducks down. And I've got that video posted. And, uh, wow. Uh, a lot of people where can, lose, their, where, lot of people where, lose where, their minds when they see that they see that footage. Other people say, I can't see anything. So, uh-huh. if you're not, if you're someone that's not a hunter or someone who's not, visual acuity in the woods. You know, you have, you have, I, had, I pointed out pretty well that still some people, some people just, you know, they can't see a deer in the foliage and they, and they can't see this deer. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's pretty obvious. And uh, the weird thing about this little, this dog man, he's the uh, flat nose variety. In other words, he's, he's got a long nose, but the, the nose is flat like a pig's now. It's, uh, it's, it's, more blunt on the end. Like and, a baboon? Uh, uh, no, not like a baboon. Uh, I've, if you go to my website uh, or, or go to my blog, the dog man, the monsters are real. Uh, I've got all kinds of pictures, uh, blow-ups of, uh, of him. But okay. uh, and uh, but the weird, even the weirder thing is there's this little bitty bean or entity on his right side of his head. And this thing has silver hair, flesh toned skin, it has a nose kinda of has a human looking face. And this little motor's mouth's moving all the time. And he's he's literally he's literally like on the side of the creature's he's holding on to the side of the creature's uh, right side of his head and shoulder. And uh uh, I've called it that sort of energy, and uh, hmm. uh, people see this. I, I, I was at a conference a couple of years ago, and this fellow walked in, and, and him and his wife just said, "Hey, we saw this conference. What we put in here?" And I had a loops of my different footage going. He's standing there, and my dog man footage come on, and he jumped back. He must have jumped three or four feet straight back, and, and he scared him to death. He said, "Oh my God." Yeah, of course, he saw it. He's like, where is it? The world is, did you get that funny jet? And uh, I've never seen it. Scared him. Scared him pretty bad. But, uh, you know, that that was my first encounter with one. I didn't know it was back there. But then David, well, you know, there are reports of dog men up there around the land between the lakes. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a story of one killing a whole family up there. Now, uh, uh, now that Shelley, uh, what's her name? Shelley Rockwell, I can't remember her full name. She has a long, 
there was this lady that was on uh, was featured in uh, Linda Godfrey's uh, one of Linda Godfrey's book where mm-hmm. she had dog men uh, harass her whole family, and it, it was on. And she saw the video and the pictures, and she said, "This dog man looked like the dog man that harassed her family." And wow. so, and uh, and what then, does their uh, body we, look like? I mean, does it? Do they look like a like? Is it more like well, a I, werewolf I, or? Well, that's a good question. I have never seen but upper torso. I mean, this one, mm-hmm. of course, you could only see its head. He was in very yeah. good visitation. And then a week a week later, uh, I was stupid enough at David's urging. So we got to get some hair samples, you know. So go back in there, and like a dummy, <laughs> I went back. In, I went back in there, and I was put, I was I was putting up, you know, bait traps, you know, hair traps with hot dogs, and I, I don't know. I didn't know what the heck a dog man was. I wasn't researching dog men, so I just kind of guessed. I put some bacon and stuff, and as I was leaving the area. Uh, I looked over to my right, and I noticed something on the side of the tree. And and then I I kind of get my camera, and I'm zooming in and out, and it, it and then it dawns on me, oh crap! And this dog man had the foliage was about head high, and it was extremely thick. And this thing was probably about my height, and he had jumped up on the side of the tree and stuck his claws into the tree and then he was leaning backwards and looking over his right shoulder at me, you know, through the foliage. And then oh, I could how see, creepy is that? And I could see uh, I kept trying to zoom in and out with the camera and I got some decent video but it's hard to focus. I'm zooming in and out. But as I'm doing this I stop uh and I'm looking at him, and I have a pistol with me. And I'm like, you know, I'm kind of thinking to myself, I need to let this guy know that I got a pistol. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, I don't, I, I, it was a, it's a forty, and I chambered around and let it, let the, let it slam back pretty hard. And when I did, he, it's kind of like he wasn't like looking directly at me, but when that, when he heard that round chamber, he turned his head and looked right, right at me. And you know how dogs can swivel their ears when they hear sounds? Yeah. Both his ears, both his ears swiveled right at me, just like boom. Oh. And so, so now I'm standing there with a pistol, and he's locked in on me, and he's got the coldest, blackest, I tell people, you know, I've, I've actually made eye contact with a Bigfoot before, and there was a you know, they are a being. They they have, you know, there's something there. You know what I'm saying? This is like when you make eye contact with another person. There's intellect. Right. There's emotion. You can see it. You can, there, there's some communications going on just by making the eye contact. This thing's eyes were just cold, dark, black, dead. He looked through me like I didn't matter, like I, almost like I wasn't even there. I, that was the. I mean, it was the oddest feeling because it, it's like, like there was like hot, a shark size, like a yeah, shark size, just cold just and nothing. Yeah, there was nothing oh. there in those eyes. It was ugh. anyway, and so I started oh. running these scenarios through my head. All right, he jumps down, runs at me on two legs, center mass, just unloading, just unloading, just you know, I, you know, I was even trying to find my knife. You know, I'm thinking this is going to get ugly. And then, you know, if he's on, and I thought if he's on all fours, he's running, you know, just be easy, just exhale, you know, center mass, and I just unload. Well, I, I'm literally waiting for him to jump off the tree. I'm waiting for the charge. It never comes. He just continues to look at me. And at kind of that moment where, you know, I kind of throw the camera back up and think I'll take this off the tree, maybe to get a better shot of him and it finally just you know you kind of have that moment when you come to yourself like all right mm-hmm. idiot get your a you know s s out of here <laughs> and so uh you know i just kind of slowly 
I slowly back out. I don't turn my back to him. I'm literally backing out. And he watches me as I go, and he lets me go. He didn't. He doesn't come off the tree. He doesn't chase me. And so that was the and that was the only two encounter. Or that was the only encounter I had where I actually saw one. I, I, I'm pretty sure I got a couple more on back trail uh, footage. Uh, some people want to argue with me about it, but, but but as far as you know, those two, you know, those are the two times that I had encounters with these things. Now, I'll kind and of these look things look. are in the same territory as Bigfoot. Yeah, this thing was Basically. actually this thing was in the same area, in that near right beside the feeding station, and. And uh, after they, the dog man, came into the area and I started finding footprints around the original feeding station, the Bigfoot activity went down to nothing. And so I went, oh. about, a, I went about three quarters of a mile away and established a new feeding station. And the Bigfoot followed me and they started coming to that feeding station. But I, they never would. And that, I don't go back into that place. That one area now, it's creepy as heck. I mean, it's a, uh-huh. it's a, it's a, it's my, uh, for lack of a better word, it's 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 uh, it's my Skinwalker Ranch area. It's not as, <laughs> there's, <laughs> you know, there's aliens, little people, all kinds of crap in there, and I don't, I stay yeah. out of that place. If I go in there, it's with a gun and with two other people. We don't, I don't go there by myself. Amen. I hear that. I. I'll have nightmares. Thank you very much, Scott. You're welcome. Ugh. I'm the one that asked you about the dog, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, just don't have a back trail camera on. And you won't have to worry about what you can't see. So well, that's where, you know, it's what's behind you. That's what I keep telling I tell everybody. It's what's behind you. Do you yeah. think there's any, you know, we're just going to have to have you back for another show. Because <laughs> we haven't even got into the Nephilim yet. Yeah. And we're just going to have to have you back for another show. Um, okay, that's we, fine. I'm, that's okay. great. I'll be glad to do it. Yeah, how about next next Monday night? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> fine with me. All right, we'll do that then. Uh, because I um, have so many questions about the... Go ahead, Rick. Where Where can I look at this footage that he's got? Uh. I want well, to. I want to see some of this footage. Okay. Did you post the, the the links? I sent yeah, you? yeah. The links are in the um, in the program description of the show. All the different uh, websites and links that he has is different blog spots and websites and um, all of that. Okay. Lauren, get you hooked up. Yeah, we have yeah. those links. Yeah. Yeah, my uh, YouTube, uh, the dog oh, man footage okay, okay. is on my YouTube channel. Just start, just start scrolling back through. You'll find that I've, I've done several different breakdowns, slow motions, blow ups. So you don't think there's any kind of uh, uh, physical relation between the dog man and the Bigfoot? They're not related biologically well you don't they, think that we well that we know of. The, uh, I'll give right. you a T. I'll give you a T. I think a lot okay. of these creatures that we see running around in the woods are genetic genetically manipulated creatures. Oh and so and so some and, and I and the next one is a actually a biblical time. And, right. Uh, it, it comes from the co-mingling that the fallen angels uh, copulated with human women and produced uh, giants, and uh, and so that was the first generation of the Nephilim. But uh, during the pre-flood world, there was all kinds of hanky panky, I think, going on, and the fallen angels were doing more uh, for corrupting uh, the DNA of all the creation. If you, if you read the book, extra biblical book of Enoch, it tells you what they were up to, and mm-hmm. uh, they were they were into all kinds of crossing animals, humans, 
fallen angels, DNA. You know, they were doing all this genetic manipulation. And uh, give you a little hint, Melba even commented to me that she didn't put it in the book or put it in the study because, you know, she was already getting that flat. But she said mm-hmm. that the, the Bigfoot's DNA appeared in some locations to be genetically manipulated. In, other words, wow. in some places, there was an extra strand of DNA. There's three strands, not just two. And it was it appeared that there may have been some genetic manipulation. And just, just another little teaser, you, you, you know, the elongated skulls that they, they're now finding right. all, over, well, all over the world. Guess what? You're, talking, you're not talking about the crystal skulls, are you? You're no, talking no, no, about... no. I'm talking about a biological entity, elongated skull. You can, if you okay. go and look them up, there's a, a people like L.A. Marzulli and some other uh, uh, biblical researchers. So they're not only him, Brian Forrester. Uh, for, uh, uh, they're starting to do DNA tests on these elongated skulls. And number one, they're not head-bound elongated. They only have two parietal plates, and the, the heads are 25% larger, so can't can't head down that. And uh-huh. they're not more fault, you know, and they're not they're basically not human. But guess what? The DNA comes back on top. Human, female, unknown, uh, uh-huh. unknown uh, male progenitor. Pretty much the on the nuclear testing is the the they come oh back just like God. the big So. So there's your case for my theory. Of course, I, you know this this book is my theory. I I, I uh-huh. I'll admit that. I give I I go through the book and I give you my proofs. What I what, you know why I think backs it up. It's just you know it's just not an it's opinion based on observation of the facts that I I get. Now some people and and for those who can't go there, but I got some friends that aren't aren't you know very very religious. And I say, well, instead of fallen angel, substitute Haley. Yeah. Oh, they're like, oh. And then after they do that, they're like, oh, okay, I can see that. So. Uh, alien, I, I did you say? Yeah, alien. A- a- alien. You know, okay. gray alien. So. Yeah. Those, yeah, because a lot of people. It's interesting. A lot of people won't accept fallen angel, but they they have no problem with an alien. And there's uh, there's <laughs> many there's many many reports. Uh, during a uh, during a Bigfoot encounter of gray aliens being with a scene, and vice versa, there's been UFO people people had mm-hmm. you know a UFO encounter that says yeah well I saw the UFO land and these three big hairy creatures ran off into the woods, and so you know for years the Bigfoot I've heard those this, stories too you know yeah, I've heard so, those stories, but and it's been that deal where the UFO people are. You know, well, we're not going to talk about Bigfoot. Ooh. And the Bigfoot people are like, oh, you're a crazy loon. There ain't no gray aliens. If they are, they're not around Bigfoot. And so you have this <laughs> you have this subset of reports that where they're both involved. And, <laughs> you know, you got these yeah. people that, you know, have these experiences. And, and like I said, if you ever get a experienced Bigfooter that has been doing this for a long time, and buying a beer and sitting down, you'll be surprised what he'll tell you. Off the record. Yep. A lot of, a lot of mm-hmm. them tell Off you. the record, yes. Yeah, they'll tell you all yeah. kinds of things off the record. Around the campfire have... without the recorder on. <laughs> and so what I did in my book is I pretty much pulled it off the campfire and put it on record. Yeah. And I've got pictures and I've got uh, other things to back up, you know. You know, from the DNA study itself to, to the photographs, I've had I've had encounters where I've recorded gray, what you would call a gray alien type being near a Bigfoot. So, wow. Yeah. Well, I think next week's show is going to be very interesting because there are a lot of of uh, there is a lot that we have not even begun to cover. I really did want to cover the Sasquatch Genome Project. Um, Mainly because I'd, I'd heard a lot of negative things about it, but I I really wanted to hear you and Jeff um, talking about it because it it because both of you 
um, have a lot of respect for Melba. And so oh, yes. that really, that you know, that really, uh, I really wanted to hear it from that point of view. And uh, um, so I really wanted to cover that, but, the, you know, 90 minutes is just not long enough to cover everything. And with the your new book, it's, it's uh, you know, I'm a Sunday school teacher, and, and I try to read my Bible regularly. <laughs> so yeah. I am very interested in hearing what you um you know what 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 your take is on this and what what you have found to 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 kind of back up your theory so we're going to have you on next monday night that sounds great to me and uh, i want to thank you for coming on tonight and we'll finish up next monday how about that scott because we are out of time that sounds great (laughs) okay well, Thank everyone. you for being on. Yes. Thank you for coming uh, on. Yes, oh, and thank you for, for all for all you people out there that, that requested him. We really appreciate it because this is a really good guest. Really fascinating. So I guess we are going to go ahead and call it a night, everyone, and we will see you next Monday night. We're going to have Scott Carpenter back for part two. And uh, so everyone have a great week. Thanks for listening to Night Caller's Bigfoot Radio. Say good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, night, everybody. (laughs) 